lovely. All right. So um, it's such a pleasure to be here today and uh, to be able to tell you a little bit about the work of the charity I lead, which is called uh, Music Masters, um, and our story since we launched in 2008 with an ambition to transform music education. Um, hence the title of my talk, which is Changing the Story of Music Education. Uh, and it's something that we're now looking to do on a national scale, uh, having rebranded in September from London Music Masters. Um, I must warn you, there are no PowerPoints, no, no slides, because it's definitely not my strength. So I'll try and keep this fairly brief um, and we can, um, we can have questions and chat at the end, if that's okay. Um, I did want to just start by showing you something from a, a new programme that we launched yesterday, uh, which is called Music Masters Creators, as I thought it would set the scene a little bit, um, particularly uh, alluding to the, the special relationships that we build with families and children um, through our deep and long-standing partnerships with schools. Um, and this, that's kind of mainly what I wanted to talk about today, those, those relationships. Um, but for now, yeah, I'll hand you over to Theo, uh, who is one of our year six violinists from a school uh, in Oval in London, who chose to express his violin learning story as a poem. And I really love how this encapsulates his memories of his earliest years watching his older brother, um, who's also come through our programme, learn, um, learn a violin and, and how he felt inspired to follow in his footsteps. Um, by the way, when you see QEH and, and BFI, that's part of his poem, it's uh, Queen Elizabeth Hall and British Film Institute, which is some of the places he's, he's done projects with us on. So now I hope this works. Uh, share the screen with you. Um, one sec. Here we go. Can you see that? Thumbs up if you can see that. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. It might be a little bit glitchy, but hopefully you can still hear, the, hear and see the words. Hello, my name is Theo and this is my violin poem. Curious infant curled up like a bear, dozily listening to a violin tune. The music makes its way inside his ears, like a blanket. The melodies cover the room. The tunes dance inside his dreams, they spiral towards his toes, swirls round his jiggling fingertips, where his joy of music grows and grows. Watching his brother practice, wishing he could have a go, wondering what his sound will be, waiting for the years yet to follow. He's a little monkey, soaping his bow, munching on hula hoops, getting ready for a show. Look at him, hear him, he knows how to play. Solo assembly, a chance to shine. BFI QBH, he'll just wait for the day. Fast forward to now, he's proud of success. He's charged through his pieces without distress. Lessons on Zoom didn't hold him back. Looking to the future, he won't slack. Violin in his life, just over a decade. Each piece, a new escapade. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'm just gonna quickly check that there's no one else that I haven't met in. I think we're working. Um, so yeah, that was Theo. Um, uh, so Music Masters aims to transform music education, as we've, as I've as mentioned, and a big part of that is removing barriers that would prevent a young person from thriving um, through music, so a young person of any background. Um, our focus is quite wide, so we, uh, our work would, would span from children age four, right up to those pursuing a professional career in music, um, which thrillingly is now some of our alumni, uh, the eldest of which are kind of are 18 now. Um, so I'm uh, going to focus in on the primary school work we do, but other barriers that we address are in the quality of music teaching, which we do through our year long PGCI programme, International PGCE, in group instrumental learning with Birmingham City University. And we also address the lack of diversity in the classical music sector so that young musicians from all backgrounds, including those we work with every day, uh, can inherit a stronger and more creative musical future and uh, a sector that genuinely welcomes and nurtures and appreciates diverse talent at every level and in every role. Um, so when we first started, uh, our charity ran an awards programme for talented young musicians on the cusp of a professional career. Um, 
so as well as providing these musicians with performance opportunities and mentoring, um, it, it, it sat side by side by a, a, a schools program. So we started in two schools. Um, and the point of this was that um, as well as giving young people uh, the, you know, the possibility of, of learning music, um, the award holders would provide uh, mentoring and inspiration and masterclasses and those types of things, um, whilst also learning and understanding the benefits of this work on their own growth as artists, so their ability to kind of reach wider audiences and connect with communities um, and how to be role models. Um, the awards programme kind of changed and over the past kind of 13 years has become has morphed into something a bit different, which is a, a, a big kind of posse of, of ambassadors, these amazing professional musicians um, who play a crucial role, I'd say, in inspiring and motivating our young musicians um, through long-term long -term sustained interaction um, and advocacy for our work and for the need for music education in schools. Um, but over the years, the schools programme, that, that programme which started in two schools has grown. So that grew from two schools in Lambeth to, at one stage, seven schools across London, all in areas facing challenges around uh, deprivation and disadvantage. Uh, we remain in five of those seven schools, with the youngest partnership being five years old. Um, so you might be wondering, what is it that we actually do in schools and, and why? Um, well, it's really important to us that we can show what a high quality sustained music education can do for children and schools and the wider community. So our school's model is aspirational and we hope that it shows children from any background and ability that they can do incredible things through and with music. Um, many of our young people just would not have had the opportunity to, to learn music had it not been through their school uh, believing in what we did. So I wanted to share a few thoughts on what has made our current schools partnerships work so well and what hasn't worked so well, um, which has actually led to us losing a few schools along the way. Uh, there are tons of factors that I could list, um, but I'll, I'll go with four just to keep it a little bit brief. Um, so the model is really important. So first of all, our model is part of the school's curriculum. It's integrated within it. Um, it needs to be so it doesn't feel like an add-on or something that can be opted out of. Um, so it sees every child from the age of four receive um, really fun child-centered musicianship lessons in which they can subconsciously learn the basic building blocks of music through song and activity and movements and, and, and lots of laughter usually. Um, however, to ensure that that learning is embedded in the school, we also, um, uh, train the class teachers alongside that so they have to be in the lesson they can't go off to their PPA time or whatever they, they have to be there and they have to participate and then they have to lead those sessions when one of our teachers isn't there um, to really make sure that 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 flows through um, and makes schools uh, you know, more musical places um, and then in key stage one the children receive three violin or cello lessons a week which is quite a lot, as you can tell. Um, so that's in large and small groups. Um, and for then those who want to continue beyond Key Stage 1, they can, and that's with an individual lesson, a large group lesson, um, ensembles and all sorts of other things, um, creative opportunities, uh, holiday courses, performances, and so on. So for many children, it's a seven-year experience with us um, of very um, hands-on, uh, learning uh, and then we have this alumni program afterwards and they, they do all sorts of things with us work experience teaching experience event design co-creation those types of things um uh so yeah I, i'm gonna get on to money in a second actually <laughs> that's probably one of the factors um that can make or break um i mean this is obviously wonderful but in our schools we have teams of anywhere between five and ten teachers often working across several rooms and across mo most days of the week. So we're, we're very present um, and with several lessons a week for the students, um, even if some take place outside of school, you know, after school, our timetables can be really difficult for schools and in particular for class teachers, especially when, you know, trying to arrange trips or deal with the pressure of assessments and all sorts of things. And, and at times it's led to some real tension, I have to say. Um, 
over the years we have learned how to how to find our way with it and, and work with schools. Um, and it's always kind of an iterative and collaborative process. Um, and we always put the needs of the child first and foremost, which can um, mean that both sides kind of have to do a bit of an ego check at times and actually really make sure that if we're saying no to something, there's a really good reason for it. Um, there's always compromise on both sides. We try and be really flexible. Um, and at the same time, our schools have really mellowed because they can see the benefits in the children uh, learning music over the long term period. So, you know, I'm sure I don't have to say to you guys, but, you know, heightened concentration, discipline, teamwork, memory and so on. And the impact that this has on the long, long term with their general development and, um, as a child. Um, however, the most important thing is that the school leadership supports and advocates for the programme. Um, and it's full integration into the school life and curriculum. If it doesn't, a program like ours is it's literally just removable and the children's musical learning could be severely disrupted, particularly for those who just wouldn't get this somewhere else. Um, and we've learned the hard way. So that leads me on to leadership. Um, over our existence, we've had three schools come and go. Um, all three had something in common, you know where this is going, uh, at the point we parted ways and that's a change of leadership. Um, and as a result, a change in priorities. Um, and this is such an issue to us because we, you know, one of our measures is the number of children whose lives we can bring music into in a sustained and meaningful way, that it's one of our top risks on our charity risk register. Um, so in our experience, there are heads that, you know, understand, when we do this, the value of music in young lives, uh, or at least say they do, even if they can't justify the expenditure. Um, and and actually, this I'm, I'm being you know silly a little bit there because there are some really good reasons why schools can't always put music into place. Um, there are heads that really understand the value of music in all young lives, and, the, and through investment, have seen it transform pupils and communities. And of course, there are some that just don't get it at all. Um, and it's difficult to know what to do about this, uh, particularly when there is little support, advocacy, and funding. The school music at policy level and at times it leads us to be perhaps unhealthily preoccupied with how to kind of demonstrate the value of music in the lives of children you know what outcomes we can show what evidence we have how it supports a child's academic development and, you know so often the evidence is qualitative like you know, stories like theo's um which doesn't always seem to cut the, must, the mustard um and it's difficult and i'd love to know the answer to that one um and then we get to money because it is related so our schools pay a significant amount for us to be there, um, probably five to 10 times as much as most primary school music budgets would be, but they make a choice to do that. Um, they're, you know, they're states, primary schools in difficult, challenged areas. You know, they're, they're no different to other state primary schools. Um, but with our partnership, we probably contribute twice as much on top of that. So it's, you know, it, it, the value is there. Um, the first three years, of our, three years of our partnership are completely free to participants. Um, and for those who want to continue beyond Key Stage 1, we ask for um, contributions for parents. We underwrite the cost, but we ask for contributions for those who can afford it, um, as this helps us to do more for the families that can't. We also provide, you know, every child with an instrument and access to amazing professional musicians, our posse of ambassadors that I was talking about, and lots of other opportunities that I also mentioned earlier. Of course, we, we have wondered if waiving fees to the programme for our schools would mitigate the risk of, of us being removed. Um, and we know that asking parents or carers for contributions or, you know, even to complete a bursary form can be off-putting, especially those parents or carers in really difficult financial situations who don't necessarily want to tell us all about their financial problems, you know. Um, and then, you know, for those who don't get music for whatever reason, you know, cultural or religious or it's just not been part of their life, um, or they don't, or they just don't see it as important. Um, however, we have actually seen that over the years, asking for a, a realistic and reasonable contribution um, or asking parents to go through that process of applying for bursary um, means that they take the value of opportunity seriously. 
and they they really become invested and engaged. Um, so that's been a really interesting learning point for us as initially we made everything free and there just wasn't the you know the the engagement from parents actually um and then finally there's something there about quality of teaching so we're really focused on teacher training as i mentioned we have a pgcei um we know that our best teachers just quite simply get the best musical outcomes for the children and we've been able to create a, a whole team of best teachers over the, the years which we're really lucky um for um and by best musical outcomes i don't mean everyone leaving year six with a grade five violin um qualification that's not what we mean it's it's uh you know ensuring that we provide an opportunity at an environment in which every child can be nurtured to reach their musical and personal potential, whatever that looks like. Um, our programme has always heavily featured large group musical learning. And this is the most commonly seen type of instrumental learning that happens in primary schools in the UK as it's, it's cheaper than one-to-one -one or small group learning. Um, and, um, you know, practically you need fewer instruments. And I mean, there are lots of other kind of practical benefits to it, but it's not always seen particularly positively. Um, we love group learning and we would, we, we advocate for it, you know, it's, it's ability to facilitate great teamwork, um, to have a cohort learning and experiencing the ups and downs together, to feel a group sense of pride and achievement after a great performance and just to lift each other up and we've seen how that works. You know, you will ask our kids what's the best thing about learning and they say playing with your friends, you know, learning together, honestly, it's, it's incredible. Um, but so many instrumental teachers don't have the skill or confidence to deliver great um, group lessons because there's no there's no training required for music teachers. And even though the group scenario is no different to a scenario that, you, that the qualified class teacher would find themselves in. Um, so our PGCI was created to address that. But beyond the, the skills of, of delivering a really good kind of group lesson, the, really, the good teaching skills, there's, there's something else, there are two other things which we teach and we, we support our student teachers to think about and learn and, and do. Uh, one of them is leadership. So leadership skills, the ability to, for the teacher to challenge and endear when, when it's required, persuade and push for change um, to achieve better outcomes for the children. Instead of simply accepting what they're being asked by the school, often by non-expert, you know, teachers and leadership to deliver uh, you know with so many times I see music teachers just going along with something um, so, and it's, uh, you know or being asked to teach in the, the nearest cupboard or you know these things and it's actually about saying no do you know what that's not going to do and that's not good value for for the money that you're paying school actually let's do it like this let's think differently um, and the second factor is about understanding the school context so many freelance teachers I've worked with have just not understood the politics, the, the pressures, the struggles, and the wider kind of education context of, sc of, of schools. Um, but our teachers having had this and being able to, to use this to their advantage, it's allowed our teachers to build strong, uh, you know, equal relationship and, and trust with schools. And where this happens in return, great teachers feel valued and great teaching happens. So I'll stop there because I realise that I'm really pushing it, but I hope that's given you some insight into our journey um, and the challenges and learnings to date. Um, and obviously that we're thinking about this a lot as we move to a kind of national scale. Does anyone want to ask me questions? I did just see something come up in the chat. So is this London, Southeast based? Yes. Yeah, so, um, I should say we're, in, we're at a, a moment of expansion outside of London and we are using the current, the, the coming year to test new models and to build new schools relationships outside of London. So we're essentially open to anything. Um, and actually one of the things we're really keen to do is to work with the resources um, that a school has. So I think you've said, very little financial input from parents. I mean, some of our schools, it's we don't get very much. Um, and so we would never, we, 
we anticipate very little in the way of income from parents, but it's more that we feel like we have to go through that process to get them brought in and engaged. Um, and that can be done in lots of different ways, whether it's, um, I don't know, they give their time, you know, there's a parent advocacy group or something else. So it's, some, it's slightly symbolic, um, but yes, I mean, please get in touch if, if you're interested. Um, our musicianship program is Kodai, um, I suppose, inspired. We have some Dalcros in it. We have some um, some other approaches as well. Um, and our string program, I suppose, has a very, uh, I suppose, I keep saying, I suppose, the, the, the influence is Suzuki and we use a lot of Suzuki repertoire and there's a lot about uh, listening and learning by ear. Um, but we do lots of other rep repertoire and um, uh, we're actively um, interested in diversifying curriculum um, and, and repertoire. So we're doing quite a lot on that at the moment. Uh, different from, yes, so we are separate from music hubs um, or music services. They became music hubs after the last national plan for music. Um, we are delivery partners with, with some of the London hubs. Um, we sit on the board of the Lambeth Hub as well. Um, we work together, but our program is very different to an offer that a, a hub would provide. Um, quite often, and I won't speak for all of the music hubs, uh, it's, they, they offer schools an, a cost, an at cost model. So that cost might be then reflected onto the parents in full, which means obviously that not all children would necessarily have the opportunity to learn. Um, but there are plenty of music hubs doing really amazing things. Um, so there have been, we actually, for example, run the summer orchestra course um, in partnership with the Lambeth Music Service. Um, and we, you know, there are all sorts of things that we do, but our relationship is deeper with schools and that's why we have a smaller number. And that's also why we launched our PGCEI so that we could support teachers to go out there and widen our impact because we knew that we couldn't be everywhere. At that that depth, um, yeah, great. So I think we're meant to finish now. I'm sorry for holding you so long, but do get in touch with me if if you're if you'd like to. I think I think you will have my details. I think if not, it's just ros at musicmasters.org.uk. Um, you'll find me on the website. Um, great. Can I just ask you a really quick question, Roz, just before we go? How, how do you get your funding for your oh, organisation? Yeah, I missed that one, didn't I? It's all right, that's okay. <laughs> uh, donors, private donors, um, and grants um, from trust and foundations mainly. We don't get any government support. Yeah. And we don't really get Arts Council funding, even though we, we try sometimes. Um, it's, it's a challenge, it really is, but we do have, we're lucky we have a four strong fundraising team. Um, and uh, some really, really committed people who like what we do. So, yeah, but it is a little bit uh, hand to mouth at times. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for coming and listening to me. Um, yeah, and do get in touch if not, and if not, have a lovely rest of your day. Great, thanks, bye, bye.